thank you, Laura. That was very nice. Um, and uh, thanks to, to Eric for both st uh, staging this and, and, uh, and running the NIST for so long and being so successful. And congratulations to, to you and all of you. In fact, uh, uh, NISC has been involved, I've been involved with NISC, I guess I should say, in various collaborations, uh, only one of which I'm going to mention today, which is the ENCODE project, uh, but also full cDNA sequencing and really sequencing the human genome and, and various other sequencing projects. Um, uh, I do want to apologize to start off is that I, um, especially speaking for Eric's symposium here, that I don't have any animation in my slides, I don't have any music or, or any of the the thing, so I, I'll, it'll, it'll look poor compared to what, um, what he normally does when he's invited to birthday parties. Uh, <clears throat> so, and then also, I just want to comment that it, it really is true what he said in the introduction that, uh, I, I don't know, maybe when we started out to sequence the human genome uh, almost 20 years ago, uh, that we thought that that's what we would do, but it, it, really, uh, it really created a field. It's a, it's a discipline that, that, uh, that came out of this. Uh, and we really are in a sequence-based world. I don't think, uh, I think we're really just barely starting to, and the talks uh, so far, I absolutely agree with these. So, so I'm going to tell you about one area that, uh, that I'm interested in uh, and have spent some time in. And that, in fact, this was really what I worked on when I was in graduate school, was transcription control. And it's really striking to see what we did back then and actually still do now, uh, where we would look at one gene. There were probably, um, I don't know, a hundred labs working on this one protein when I was a graduate student who, that binds to DNA and regulates transcription and DNA replication. Uh, and uh, now we are, and that was one gene and one, and one protein, and now we are trying to look at all the genes and all the proteins at once uh, thanks to uh, genomics. So what we're really going to talk, what I'm going to talk about really is mostly just the transacting part of this, the proteins that bind to DNA, and it really only one type of protein, the time, type that binds to uh, sequence, uh, very specific sequences. They're, cr they're chromatin binding proteins that do this more globally. And then also we care about the cis-acting sequences or the regulatory sequences that, to which they bind, and these are all over the genome as well. So the, uh, these transacting components, the th reason this is so striking is that we have so many. It's a little bit unfortunate. We, we uh, dedicate about a tenth of our genome to regulating our genome, uh, or at least in terms of DNA binding proteins, ones that regulate transcription, uh, uh, DNA replication, other things as well. And luckily, com un unlike the slide I showed you earlier, which was an electron micrograph, or related biochemical assays, which are one gene, one protein at a time, very, very tediously, uh, in, with naked DNA. We now have assays that allow us to look at the interaction of proteins that bind to DNA inside living cells, and this is CHIP or chromatin IP. Uh, and here's a, a diagram, I think probably most of you know it. You take cells, you cross-link uh, very gently with a chemical agent, you cross-link the DNA to, uh, the proteins to DNA. While the cell's still alive, you freeze them, you break it open, sonicate the DNA to break it into 500 base pair fragments. And then you use an antibody to immunoprecipitate the, fra the, the, the transcription factor or the protein that you're interested in. And then you take what you've immunoprecipitated and analyze it in some way. You re reverse the crosslinks, remove the proteins. All the junk supposedly is washed away. And what most people have done is something called chip, chip, or chip, chip array, where you then take this DNA and hybridize it to an array. There are other ways to do this. You can use quantitative PCR just to check for fragments that you're interested in. And what I'm going to show you is that it should have been, it was obvious, I think, from the beginning you could use DNA sequencing, but the new sequencing technologies uh, really help to make that. And this, there's an excellent uh, description of this in this textbook here that you can uh, buy multiple copies of if you're so inclined. So, <clears throat> um, the, uh, the short read sequencing, which you've already heard about, uh, various versions of them, and, and I, I echo what uh, Richard uh, Gibbs said uh, and, uh, and others have said. These platforms are changing rapidly, and I think we're going to, they're, they're already working reasonably well now, and I think we're going to see great improvements in them. And they all have one thing in common that differs from, from uh, traditional sequencing. It's not so classical, but, but of Sanger sequencing. Instead of cloning the fragments and looking and, 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 and addressing them one at a time, albeit with robots in the big genome centers, uh, Instead of addressing them one at a time, you just spread them on a surface, beads or, or a flat surface, and sequence them in situ. They're sort of single molecule sequencing. That they, they're not really right now. They amplify in situ. Uh, some of the new techniques are actually true sing, single 
uh, molecule. They're short reads. They, only, they, they tend to be uh, 25, 35 or, or base pairs or so. You can get them larger than that with some of the technologies. And the key here is lots and lots of reads, easy and cheap. Uh, and you want them to be accurate enough so that you can actually read them, all right? So I'm going to tell you about one transcription factor, or a couple transcription factors, but mostly about one called NRSF, or REST. It's an amazing transcription factor. Uh, it's called, neuro, it's also, uh, NRSF stands for Neuron Restrictive Silencing Factor. It's also called uh, something else by another laboratory. David Anderson and Gail Mandel's labs discovered this protein about 15 years ago. It's a zinc finger protein. It has eight zinc fingers. It's an unusual DNA binding protein, and it recognizes a 21 base pair fra uh, fragment. That's really large for, for the cis-acting sequences that transcription factors bind to. Most of them are about 6 to 8 to 10 the most. Uh, REST is interesting because it's a repressor. It may act, act as an activator in some cases, but it's mostly a repressor uh, that uh, turns off neuron-specific genes in non-neuronal cells. But it also turns off those kind of genes, at least some of them, in neurons as well. So it's involved in and uh, the whole process of neuronal maturation, differentiation, and actually maintenance as well. And it works with cofactors, and we actually understand a little bit about its mechanism, but almost all of the work um, early, uh, until recently was uh, taking this transcription factor and looking at it binding to a few genes. So what we decided we wanted to do, and lots of others as well, and for this transcription factor and all of the others really, is to identify all the binding sites in the human genome and actually why not, why stop there, the mouse and other genomes as well, uh, determine which ones are occupied in different cell types and different cell states. And we learn a lot about biology by being able to do that. And then, um, and then we actually, I'm not, I may not have time to tell you this, but we then compare gene expression from those genes as well as the methylation status at the CPG rich sequences in the, uh, or, or the chromat and the chromatin state in those regions. And what we want, we want everything. And, and I think one of the lessons we've learned um, um, uh, especially from our big genome center colleagues, um, uh, is that we should be really greedy about what we want. And it, because we, if, you, if you set your sights that high, you can usually, you can often figure out how to do it. And really, you want everything. You want it to be comprehensive. You'd like it to be completely unbiased. And this is one of the big differences between uh, using a microarray to look at the chip-related, uh, chip uh, uh, immunoprecipitated materials or using real-time PCR. If you sequence it, in theory, you should be able to find, every, you should see everything that's there. You want it to be fast, accurate, cheap, et cetera. So we started, uh, we tried this, and we, by the way, is my laboratory and Barbara Wald's laboratory. Barbara is at Caltech, and she's been studying transcription uh, for longer than I have. And um, uh, we, we just decided to try to test uh, the immunoprecipitated materials with, um, with one of these ultra-fast or ultra-high throughput sequencing platforms. And so we worked with Selexa. The idea is you do it exactly the same way. You, uh, you, we add an, a cross -link, uh, an amplification step during the, uh, after the cross-linking, size select it, and, and uh, sequence it by Selexa. And the data look, uh, look remarkable. Now, this, I'm, we're cheating a bit because this transcription factor is such an easy one to look at. It has such a large binding site. It's a very a fantastic monoclonal antibody that works for it. doesn't work as w quite as well as this for everything, but, uh, but in general, we're seeing the same types of, uh, of um, uh, results, which is this is a browser shot of just a little tiny portion of the genome. Uh, what these are... Each one of these little red things is a block, is a sequence read that is being placed. So you sequence it by, by these, one of these fast techniques, the stuff that's immunoprecipitated, and then you take the reads, the ones that you can place uniquely on the genome, you place them on computationally, and here's where they landed on this particular one, and you get a peak here. And that's a lot of data saying that something is binding there. You, it turns out you don't need, only, you only need about 10 or so tags to be above, uh, way, way above background and, and a threshold that we set, probably a very conservative threshold we set. Okay, we found about a, a 2,000 sites um, bound, occupied by this protein in one particular cell type. We've now looked at this in multiple cell types. Uh, and this was only with about a million and a half reads. Um, uh, these platforms, potentially from a read can give you, from a run, can give you about 40 million reads uh, in theory, probably higher on some of them. And I suspect by next year it'll be 100 million, uh, and we hope so anyway. Okay. The thing that struck us about this is that the background is incredibly low. This is the unimmune un or, 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 or the mock immunoprecipitation here, and this is what the genome looks like. You get reads every once in a while. We have a few places in the genome where we do pile up reads that we think it's not a real binding site that has to do that we have almost surely attributed to 
them being uh, misplaced reads because of, of sort of low copy repeats, okay? So here's an example of the kind of discoveries you can make with this. This protein, this gene was known to be, uh, to be uh, uh, regulated by NRSF from sort of uh, uh, classical <laughs> genetic kinds of, uh, molecular genetics kinds of experiments, NeuroD, um, uh, was known to be occupied, but the uh, people had tried very hard to find the binding site for it. They couldn't find it in the promoter. They couldn't find it, and they looked and looked and looked, 100 kb upstream and 100 kb downstream. And, uh, or, or not 100 kb downstream, but looked downstream uh, as well as they could uh, uh, with, with the knowledge that they had of the binding site uh, five or six years ago, okay? And uh, people tried uh, scanning through the gene biochemically to look for, for binding sites and never found one, so we did this experiment. And right there, in, not really in the middle of the gene, uh, but, um, but in an exon of the gene, you have a, a binding site that clearly regulates the transcription of the gene. So you, we found lots of examples of these where, well, many new sites that had never been observed, but even in some genes that people had studied where they didn't know uh, where the binding would occur. Um, here's uh, a type of thing that you can learn from this, and, and again, this is where the agnostic or, and global natures of, the, of the, this kind of uh, approach is important. You're not having a preconceived hypothesis about what should be bound or what shouldn't be bound. You go in and you just see. And what happens in the, uh, just even looking at a couple of cell types, we learn that there are a variety of transcription factors that are, are, that are, uh, are repressed, the, the uh, genes themselves are repressed by NRSF, and these genes are involved in beta cell, uh, pancreatic beta cell uh, um, uh, development. Uh, and maintenance, and sure enough, from that, just from making the guesses from this, um, from this type of finding, we go in and we find that they are indeed involved when you look at them on an individual basis. Okay, that's actually a new surprise role for this, this protein, and maybe not terribly shocking, but, but one that was not known before. Another thing that we learned from this, and we actually are getting a hint of this in other transcription factors as well, is that you, not all the sites that are occupied by a protein actually look like the consensus binding site. We, that's a common tool is to, to say, oh, here's the sequence. You can show it biochemically, maybe that it binds to this. But in fact, there's some slop of, uh, in the binding. And then, and then occasionally, as I'll show you, you, you see binding, and it's, there's no question that it's occupied, a site is occupied, but it has nothing to do with the, uh, the, the, the uh, the NRSF uh, occupant um, um, consensus site. But one thing we did learn is that there are a, a fair number of sites that look like half sites. And this is not shocking, I suppose, with eight zinc fingers, maybe four of them or so binding to half site with the rest of the site occupied but not, uh, not in the same way as, as, the, as the whole site. But what was interesting is, is that they're actually about 15% uh, of the sites don't look like they're bound, that look like either a half site or a whole site. And this is showing up in other transcription factors as well. And we suspect, I'll, it, it, it's possible that it recognizes the two very different types of DNA sequences, but we suspect that it's actually binding it by binding on top of another protein that's bound to the DNA in that site. And uh, uh, if, if we actually truly can get that kind of sandwiching from these experiments, I think we're going to be able to learn a lot about transcription. You can do the same kind of thing with the chip, with chip data that you do with gene expression data where you cluster it and you try to get an idea of the types of genes in a particular cell type or cell state, which types of genes are, are in this case now being occupied by the protein. Uh, this is really useful in the case where you have no idea what a protein does. What a, what a transcription factor does. We know a lot about this, so it, much of this is confirmatory, but we now know a lot more genes and genes that are involved in particular pathways in particular cell types, and it does differ in differ, different cell types. And you particularly see this, uh, the interesting changes in these patterns when you look at neurons. You still are repressing some of the genes in neurons. Every neuron doesn't express every neuronal gene. And we are learning a lot about the different types. The, the biggest problem we have here is you don't easily get cultured neurons from, from any uh, mammalian system. So uh, it's, it's hard to do the real biology you'd like to do here. I think one of our challenges would be figure out how to do this in tissues. And unfortunately, the cross-linking makes it very difficult. You have to cross-link sort of evenly. If you overdo it or underdo it, it doesn't work. And so you really can't do it in a mass of tissue. You have to do it with tissue that, uh, with cells that are dispersed. Okay. Uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, I think, a little bit of an obnoxious slide. It's showing the, the performance of the technique, and it really has held up with, with most transcription factors similarly, where you plot the fraction of, of true positives versus the fraction of false positives. Uh, and most curves for, most, uh, for the other techniques for CHIP 
look like this, and you're trying to struggle to find, well, where do I set my threshold so I'm getting not too many false uh, uh, positives while I, I'm, I don't want to throw away the, the good results that I have. And at least with, the, with the, uh, the, uh, the way that we've been doing this, and we actually feel like we understand the, the parameters that make this important, you can really set your threshold on this where you're, you're getting very few false positives and, and almost uh, getting almost all your true, true positives. Okay. One of the other features, and, and uh, this is held up, although not quite as uh, strongly as it has for NRSF, in that, uh, that you actually, um, if you do chip-chip or chip array, you basically are, are narrowing down a binding site to about 500 base pairs, maybe even a little bigger than that. Okay, you're not really sure. And when you're looking at a sequence-specific binding protein, or really any DNA binding protein, you'd like to know exactly where it's sitting on the DNA. That actually helps you think about the network of other proteins that are bound. I like to think about the contacts, having studied these things biochemically originally, about how the protein actually lands on it. And when you do this, uh, when you do chip seek, uh, when you sequence uh, the, uh, the chip products, uh, with this, uh, and you get enough reads, and especially the way these uh, that we made the products to put onto the sequencing machine, which is with shearing and, and uh, serious size selection, you end up narrowing it down to a really, really tiny area. And in fact, if the, the deeper you sequence, the more narrow it becomes. And so, some of you might know the technique selects. It's a method for, for taking a DNA binding protein and selecting out from a mixture of oligo, a very, very large mixture of oligonucleotides, what it can bind to. Uh, it's a, we've done this a fair amount in my laboratory. It's a tedious, difficult technique. It, it does work. I think this is the new selects. You don't need to do it biochemically. You can do it, I uh, can't believe I'm saying that, but you can do it with uh, inside living cells rather than, um, and, the, and the deeper you go in your reads, the, the more you can narrow that down, okay? Um, R.N. Sedow and a postdoc in his lab, Anton Valu, have, uh, uh, took the data that we got and, and uh, were helping develop the algorithms for doing the placement of the reads against the genome and making the calls and the peak calls and came up with an obvious idea, I guess, that we had not thought of, which is that if you look at the sequence reads, these are 20, 35 base reads actually that we're doing, if you actually look at their directionality on the genome, uh, and this is held up, uh, this, this works on, on essentially every binding site, these blue ones are coming from this end and the yellow ones are coming from this end going that way, uh, if, you, if you color code them, they actually home in onto the very top of the binding site. So that actually serves two purposes. It helps to narrow it down, but also gives you more confidence about the placements of the reads when, they, when, they, when it works this way. This is two binding sites for, um, for uh, um, uh, NRSF in, uh, in, in another experiment. So we've done this on a bunch of transcription factors. Uh, here's some of them. Um, there's one called GA binding protein I'll speak of in a minute. Serum response factor is an important one for, for, uh, for uh, stress response as well. Uh, some standard transcription factors, um, RNA polymerase II, uh, other chromatin binding proteins. And we'll be applying this to several hundred such proteins for the ENCODE project as we're starting up the scale up of that uh, funded by the NHGRI. Uh, one I will tell you a little bit about that's been one of my favorite ones that we're just barely getting a hint of now is FOXP2. It's a forkhead transcription factor. This is, this is in humans. It's, con it's a highly conserved transcription factor in, in all species. Very, very little sequence variation in it. And mutation at one residue in a family, Tony Monaco and others have uh, discovered this and reported this years ago, uh, causes um, uh, the loss of language in humans. So it's one of, the, one of the very few true behavioral genes. It doesn't look like it's a mechanical problem, that it's a processing uh, problem largely. Okay, uh, we don't really understand, but it's a transcription factor. And this is one of those, even though forkhead or FOX factors in general have, a, uh, there's a family, they have sort of similar binding sites. The actual binding site for this was, uh, is not known, although we're starting to learn it. Only four base pairs differ between humans and chimp uh, in, in, this, uh, uh, in this transcription factor. I don't think we will find the reason that chimps can't speak and we can by, by understanding this, but I'll bet you we will understand something about language from from being able to study it. So Simone Martique in my lab, is a graduate student in my lab, has been studying this. It's been a hard one, didn't have good antibodies. She had to make her own uh, multiple uh, tries, uh, was able to now do this. And what we've learned, we've now found um, uh, about nine, eight to 900 binding sites in, particular, in one particular cell type uh, that are occupied by this factor. It looks like it's primarily an activation factor, although in some cases we think it might be uh, it might be repressing. Uh, interestingly, it binds to several places in its own promoter. Another student in my lab has 
uh, Diane Schroeder has looked at the, uh, this whole fairly large region and found multiple promoters for the, for the gene. Uh, and so it clearly is autoregulatory, not, a, not terribly surprising. That happens with a lot of uh, transcription factors, not all. Uh, the, uh, it also binds to, to one of its family members, the FOXP1 promoter. So we're just now starting to explore this and try to understand how the network of, of binding works. So uh, I'm going to tell you one more story, I think, um, uh, and this is, uh, relates a little bit to the cis acting sequences. So one thing we did um, uh, several years ago, Nathan Trinkline and Shelley Force Aldred in, uh, in my lab uh, discovered that, uh, and this was when the human genome sequence was first really getting finished, and uh, we discovered that about 11% of our genes are arranged in a bidirectional way. Um, and actually what that means is, and, and that means pointing outwards, bidirectionally uh, and being in terms of divergent transcription, where this distance is less than a KB. And in fact, if you look at the distribution, you may not be able to see this, most of them are about 100 or 150 bases apart. And that really surprised me because um, uh, that's not a whole lot of room. That's really a, about the size of a, a transcriptional promoter. I'm not going to show you a lot of uh, the other data, but what we've done is a whole bunch of mutagenesis experiments to look at these. They, cl they clearly share transcription elements in, uh, uh, within that 100 base pairs or so. One thing we've learned uh, is that they're co-express. If they're, both, uh, they're either both up or both down in a cell type for almost all of them, for 95% of them. Uh, not, uh, they don't, uh, they're not anti-regulated. Uh, this arrangement is conserved in, in other mammals as well. Uh, what a, a new thing that we did is that we collaborated with Ping Wing at Boston University uh, and her student Jane Lin, um, where they looked, we looked for uh, overrepresented motifs within that 100 or 150 base pairs or so, and there were about uh, six or seven of them. But one in particular that really showed up uh, as being highly overrepresented is for a protein called GA binding protein. This is a transcription factor that's involved in a whole lot of metabolic processes and, and many other processes. There's not one, one single pinpoint uh, thing that you can say about it. It's an ETS transcription factor, ETS family transcription factor, uh, forms a tetramer uh, and binds to a sequence that looks like this. It's a little bit more extended than that. What Patrick Collins did, a student in my lab did, was he did partly computation, but he really did a, a bunch of experiments to show that almost all the bidirectional promoters are bound by this protein. So we're not going to say that it's the only, it's clearly not the only protein that regulates bidirectional promoters, but it really looks like it's one, and, and this is true in different cell types, and they're somewhat, if you, the more cell types we look at, the more, uh, uh, the truer this becomes, or the closer it becomes to a, uh, uh, to a, um, uh, to 100%. And interestingly, some, um, some unidirectional promoters, ones where there's a promoter and a gene going in this direction with no obvious gene going in the other direction, some of them are bound by this, and almost all of those that are bound by GABP actually have a transcript going in the other direction in, when we look in, in, uh, in, in transfection experiments. The other thing that Patrick did is that he added the GAB binding protein site, the, the consensus site, into some of those unidirectional promoters, and now it makes those look, work in the opposite direction. So it probably, this is a very strong activator protein. It's like uh, VP16 for some of those uh, transcription folks might know. Uh, very, very strong activator. We suspect that it just helps to grab RNA polymerase and its, uh, and its components to transcribe uh, uh, maybe a little bit more promiscuously than another promoter would. Okay. So um, uh, sort of to get close to wrapping up here, if you think about what I just talked about with regard to using ultra short read, or short read, ultra high throughput sequencing uh, methods, uh, the key there is actually ultra high throughput, ultra cheap. It, that, it, I mean, you could, you could sequence with regular methods and do this, it's just you'd spend a fortune doing it. And so for a few hundred dollars or maybe a thousand dollars, you can get a whole interactome for, uh, for, for many of the transcription factors. And that's actually substantially cheaper than doing the chip arrays or chip chips, which you have to do often in triplicate or even more to get uh, reliable or even partially reliable data. If you think about that, that's a census, a sequence census method you're counting. It's a digital me uh, readout uh, like some of the others referred to. And you could apply this to a lot of things. And we've actually applied it not only to sequence-specific binding proteins, obviously to chromatin proteins. Eric Lander's group is doing this. Other, many others are doing this now as well. It's, it's, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, telling us a lot about what the, what the global structure of the, of the genome looks like in a living cell. But why not use it to count RNAs? And so many groups, uh, 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 Rick Wilson's group does this, uh, many others as well, where you use it instead of microarrays to figure out how, what, what RNAs are there. Barbara Wald's lab has been really trying to develop this as a way to look at alternative splices as well. It's working really well. I don't have time to tell you, but we've applied this to a methylation method where we're looking globally at all the CPG islands at once to see which ones are, 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 uh, are methylated and which ones are not methylated in particular cells. And so again, it's like a snapshot. And I'll bet you there are many others uh, that we haven't thought about, or, or at least we haven't thought about, that, uh, that are counting methods that could come in handy. So I'll end by thanking a lot of this work was started by Nathan and Shelley when they were graduate students in the lab. Uh, Chip Seek was developed uh, uh, with uh, but with Barbara Wald's lab and her student Ali Mortazavi and my senior scientist, uh, my postdoc Dave uh, Johnson, and then Ji Ping and these others as, as well, and I'd like to thank them. So I'll end there. Questions? Questions from the audience? Rick, is, is, it seems to me that ChIP-seq uh, still requires good antibodies. Yeah. And where, where does that, where do we stand on that if we're really going to do any sort of comprehensive profiling? Um, so, and that's the problem with all, uh, with CHIP in general, is you have to have a, a uh, one that is specific for the protein that you're, uh, that you're studying, and, you, and actually proving that a specific is non-trivial. Uh, NIH should have, and I hope they will, set up an, a, a trans-NIH uh, effort to make monoclonal antibodies for every single protein in the human genome. We've got to do it. It's crazy not to. NHGRI is taking a, a bold step by having us do, I think, 200 and something of the factors ourselves. I'm not sure if the other, um, the other groups will be doing those uh, as well. Uh, we, but for 1,500 for, for DNA binding proteins, we have a long w way to go on that. And I, uh, it's surprising, uh, monoclonals work better, I mean, in general, the best, the three or four best ones we've had have been monoclonals. And, and the advantage of that is that you can probably get your specificity, and they do immunoprecipitate well as long as you screen enough of them. We probably need two, two antibodies for each uh, protein to show that, uh, to get some sense of specificity as well. Any questions from the floor? If not, 